At last, on the 20th of March, at six o'clock in the morning, I learned that the king and the whole court had left Paris during the night and that the city was without magistrates or military leaders. I left my retreat, intending to return home, for I was anxious about my wife, whom I had left indisposed and whom I had not seen for eight days. As I came out of the Rue d'Artois to cross the boulevards, I met General Sebastiani in a cabriolet. He told me the news of the king's departure, but he knew nothing of the emperor. I have a mind, I said, to go and inquire at the post office. I seated myself next to him. When I entered the audience room that precedes the closet of the postmaster general, I found a young man sitting before a table and asked him whether Count Ferrand was still in the house. He answered that he was, and I gave my name, begging him to ask for me a few moments' conversation with Count Ferrand. I had never seen him before, but I had heard that he was an infirm old man and the father of a family. I was surprised at his delay in setting off, and through a feeling of generosity, I wished to protect his escape and ensure his safety. Monsieur Ferrand came, but without stopping or listening to me, he opened his closet. I did not follow him there, but I went to another room where I found the chief clerks delighted to see me again and disposed to do anything to oblige me. Monsieur Ferrand, after having put up his papers, went away and left his closet at my disposal. I had a great desire to fly to Fontainebleau and embrace the emperor, but I wished to see my wife before I went." To reconcile these two feelings, I resolved to write to Fontainebleau. An express was given me, who went off immediately. I acquainted the emperor with the departure of the king and solicited his orders for the post office, which Monsieur Ferrand had left vacant. As soon as the express was gone, I went home and remained there an hour. I was far from thinking that the short and natural step I had taken would be charged upon me as a crime. I had so little desire to take possession of the post office that I went to Prince Cambiseris to consult him on what I was to do. I found him, according to the custom of his whole life, complaining of ill health and struggling against the sufferings caused by his daily medicines. I communicated to him my visit to the post office. I pointed out to him the situation of Paris, deprived of magistrates and perhaps at the point of an explosion of the most dangerous character. I had forgotten to mention that after the departure of Count Ferrand, my fear that the cash might be plundered made me go to General de Sols, the commander of the National Guards, and beg he would send a detachment of soldiers to protect the money. The officer who commanded them did not even consult me in placing the sentries. One of the clerks took that task upon himself when the prince learned these particulars. He replied with his usual coolness and gravity. You have undoubtedly acted very wisely. I foresee all the confusion that will prevail in Paris, but I shall take great heed not to say a word or make a sign by which the emperor may suspect that I have anticipated his resolutions. I have not forgotten that he reprimanded me on his return from the Russian campaign. I will tell you the circumstance for your information. You know that during his absence, it was I who presided at the council. The affair of Malay took us by surprise. You know he was sentenced with some of his accomplices. They were executed. When the emperor arrived at the Tuileries, he sent for me. And as soon as he perceived me, he came up to me with looks that seemed to pierce me through and through. Who allowed you, he said, trembling with anger, to shed the blood of my subjects without my order? They were brave soldiers who had a hundred times exposed their lives for me and the glory of their country. Have you forgotten that the most precious jewel in my crown is to pardon? I know not what prevents me from punishing you severely for it. It is not necessary, I think, added Prince Cambiseris, for me to say any more in the matter, and you may easily suppose that I have not the least wish to expose myself once more to his resentment. As for me, Monseigneur, I answered, I act for his interest and have dispatched to him an express. I shall undoubtedly receive an answer, for which I am going to wait at the post office. 
On my return there, I was really surprised to learn that Count Ferran was not yet gone. The post horses had been waiting with the carriage from six o'clock in the morning. The old man appeared quite beside himself, and all the exertions of his family were unable to persuade him to leave the place. He wanted to go to Ghent and sent to me for a permit for post horses. I repeatedly refused to give him one, declaring that I had nothing to say there, that he was the sole master at the post office and might protect himself by his own signature. But Monsieur Ferrand, prepossessed with the idea that the return of the emperor was owing to some great conspiracy, of which I was one of the heads, insisted on having some paper in which my handwriting should stand, convinced that that alone would protect him in this journey, and especially in the streets of Paris. His wife said to me, it is for his safety that we ask you that permit. At these words, I hesitated no longer, and I enclosed the paper of which he made no use, not having been once obliged to draw it out of his pocketbook until he arrived at Orléans, where he remained more than six weeks. The conduct of the ministry in those days, and especially that of Monsieur Ferrand was inexplicable. The king, before he went away, had issued a proclamation wherein he exhorted the Parisians, and consequently all France, to submission. This proclamation was inserted in the Moniteur of the 20th. Its aim was to make all the royalists lay down their arms, and still one of my crimes was stopping the departure of the Moniteur and other journals. But if such great importance was attached to the publication of that last will of the king's, why did not Monsieur Ferrand dispatch it the day before by express? It might have traveled 60 leagues in 24 hours in all directions, except on the road to Lyon, and the prefects would at least have known how to act. I always suspected that the reason why Monsieur Ferrand did not send it off was because it did not please him. The man has so publicly acknowledged his wishes and his opinions that I do not think I speak ill of him in saying that he wanted a civil war to break out, which the proclamation might prevent. As for the rest, I own I did wrong in stopping the journals. They could do no harm. Besides, the proclamation was stuck up in all the streets, and whoever wished to read it might do so. Though I wish to be sparing in anecdotes, I cannot, however, omit one that paints admirably well the men who at that time had so fatal an influence over our affairs. The proclamation I mentioned had been digested by the Chancellor d'Ambray, but the order for its insertion in the Moniteur had not been delivered. The editor of that journal went at 10 o'clock in the evening to Monsieur de Vitrol, secretary of the council, to ask for the order. Monsieur de Vitrol sent him to the chancellor. After having repeatedly rung the bell, the porter appeared at a small window and said that no one could then see his master who was asleep. Monsieur M, vexed at not being able to obtain an audience, even of the porter, made a great noise, saying that he came by order of the king. And at last, they were obliged to let him in and walk upstairs. There he had a fresh ceremony to go through before he could penetrate to his excellency. The valet de chambre was to be awakened and dressed. And afterwards, the master himself roused from the arms of Morpheus. At last, M found himself in the presence of the head of the law, whom he asked for an order of insertion in the moniteur. Oh, yes, to be sure. The proclamation. Have you seen it? Then, without waiting for an answer, my lord took it from under his pillow and began to read it slowly, complacently, and with pauses and inflections in his voice, which showed all his paternal affection for that masterpiece of composition. This is, said he, one of the things I have written most correctly, and I fear not to say that it is one that will make the greatest sensation. Yes, you may print it. So saying, he laid himself down again on his pillow and closed his eyes. My thoughts were solely occupied with the fearful burthen I should have upon my shoulders in a few hours later, for I was resolved not to accept of any other employment than that of the post office. And I found myself by degrees engaged in fulfilling the duties of postmaster general. I was encouraged 
and seconded by the commissioners and by all the clerks who were delighted at seeing the Bourbons put to flight and convinced, as well as myself, that we should never look upon them again. Indeed, they were already so completely forgotten that their reign of 11 months appeared to us nothing more than an uneasy dream of a few hours after having arranged the business of the post office in the best way I could for the interest of the emperor. I went to the Tuileries. Five or six hundred officers on half pay were walking in the extensive courtyard, wishing each other joy at the return of Napoleon. In the apartments, the two sister-in-laws of the emperor, the queen of Spain, and of Holland, Hortense, were waiting for him deeply affected. Soon after, the ladies of the household and those of the empress came to join them. The fleur-de-lis had everywhere superseded the bees. However, on examining the large carpet spread over the floor of the audience chamber, where they sat, one of the ladies perceived that a flower was loose. She took it off and the bee soon reappeared. Immediately, all the ladies set to work, and in less than half an hour, to the great mirth of the company, the carpet again became imperial. In the meanwhile, time passed on. Paris was calm. Those persons who lived far from the Tuileries did not come near it. Everybody remained at home. The departure of the king and the arrival of the emperor were such singular events that the 14 centuries the monarchy had existed did not in their course present one as extraordinary, and nevertheless indifference seemed to pervade the minds of all. Were these events above the capacity of common men? Or rather, did not the good sense of the people make them feel that it was not for their happiness that two monarchs were wrestling for the throne and that they would reap from it nothing but sufferings and sacrifices? But it was not the same in the country. Officers who arrived at Fontainebleau preceding the emperor told us it was extremely difficult to advance on that road. Deep columns of peasants lined it on both sides, or rather had made themselves masters of it. Their enthusiasm had riv risen to the highest pitch. It was impossible to say at what hour he would arrive. Indeed, it was desirable that he should not be recognized, for in the midst of their delirium and confusion, the arm of a murderer might have reached him. He therefore resolved to travel with the Duke de Vincenza, Calancourt, and a common cabriolet, which at nine o'clock in the evening stopped before the first entrance near the iron gate of the Quay of the Louvre. Scarcely had he alighted when the shout of long live the emperor was heard, a shout so loud that it seemed capable of splitting the arched roofs. It came from the officers on half pay, pressed, almost stifled, in the vestibule who filled the staircase up to the top. The emperor was dressed in his famous great frock coat. I went up to him, and the Duke de Vincenza Calicor cried to me, For God's sake, place yourself before him, that he may get on. He then began to walk upstairs. I went before, walking backwards, at the distance of one pace, looking at him, deeply affected, my eyes bathed in tears, and repeating in the excess of my joy, What? It is you! It is you! It is you at last! As for him, he walked up slowly, with his eyes half closed, his hands extended before him, like a blind man, and expressing his joy only by a smile. When he arrived on the landing place of the first floor, the ladies wished to come to meet him, but a crowd of officers from the higher floor leaped before them, and they would have been crushed to death if they had shown less agility. At last, the emperor succeeded in entering his apartments. The doors were shut, not without difficulty, and the crowd dispersed, satisfied at having seen him. Towards 11 o'clock in the evening, I received an order to go to the Tuileries. I found in the saloon the old ministers, and in the midst of them, the emperor talking about the affairs of government with as much ease as if we had gone 10 years back. He had just come out of his bath and had put on his undress regimentals. The subject of the conversation and the manner in which it was carried on, the presence of the persons who had so long been employed under him contributed to a face completely from my memory, the family of the Bourbons and their reign of nearly a year. However, on one of the tables there stood in confusion marble busts of Louis the Sixteenth, the Dauphin, father of the present prince and some of the princesses. These 
busts recalled to our memory the recollection of the day before. On the following day, they all disappeared. When the emperor perceived me, he advanced a few steps, drew me into another chamber, and rather pushed me gently before him. Then pulling me by the ear, he said, Ah, are you here, Mr. Conspirator? No, indeed, sire. And you know, if the truth has been told to you, that I would have nothing to do with the business in which Monsieur blank. It is well, it is well. Fouché was the ready minister of the police. Our conversation, or rather the emperor's everlasting questions began. He concluded by offering me the ministry of the home department. No, sire, your majesty will want a man accustomed to general business and who ought to bear a name celebrated in the revolution. I entreat you to give me again the post office where I may be of service to you. Well then, said he, I shall name Carnot for the home department. This was a good choice. Not but that the manners of Carnot, which were rather dry and his want of experience, gave rise to some complaints. But he was a sincere man who ardently wished the good of France. Two months afterwards, the emperor still congratulated himself with his choice and said to me, Carnot is a very honest man. My audience had been preceded by one given by Monsieur Molay, who had refused the appointment of Minister of Justice and Foreign Affairs to return to the roads and bridges, which had been entrusted to him before the last reign. These several audiences continued till very late. At last, at about three o'clock in the morning, the emperor returned to the saloon and said, make out the patents for all these gentlemen. As for Lavalette, he does not want any. He has conquered the post office. There was in the tone with which he uttered these words something satirical and even a little bitter that made me feel he was hurt at my conduct. In fact, I officiated during the three months at the post office without having obtained any letters patented. This strange count might therefore have been added to my indictment and they might have put in accused of having during the reign of the emperor, filled the situation of postmaster general without any written authorization from him. This was the second time Napoleon had taken possession of France. The first was on the 18th of Brumaire in 1799, when he came back from Egypt. France was then a republic governed by the directory, a machine worn out, as well as by the powerful attacks of foreigners as by its own bad administration. Detested and fallen into disrepute, civil war was rising up before its eyes. Rebellion triumphed over its power, and the people seemed only waiting for a man who might help them to cast off the hateful yoke. Nevertheless, how much solicitude, how many maneuvers were required to arrive at the revolution of the 18 Brumaire on his way from Fréjus to Paris and particularly at Lyon. All ranks of men, aristocrats, emigrants, citizens, peasants, all whispered in his ear, overturn the directory, take the power into your hands. But on all sides also he must have heard the firm voice of the Republicans who said aloud to him, take the power into your hands, conquer, but let us be free. To succeed, he wanted the consent of CAs, a grave and theoretical organizer of republics, and Roger Ducot, his colleague, if the majority of the directory had possessed energy, they might have had him arrested. And then, even if the sword of justice had not dared to strike him, he would have expiated his glory and his temerity by banishment and perhaps transportation. How wide was the difference in March 1815? Fallen from the throne, erased from the list of sovereigns, banished to the rock, of the island of Elba, he returned almost alone. Scarcely did he set his foot on the French shore when the people everywhere rose up. All France repeated with enthusiasm, Napoleon, no more royalty, no more Bourbons. It is Napoleon alone that France wishes to have. It is his glory, his genius she stands in need of. Woe to those who shall dare to raise a finger against him, or rather, woe to those who shall not declare in his favor. And in fact, peasants, soldiers, citizens, all hastened to meet him. 
all hailed him with their wishes and their gratitude like a good genius, like a providence. The royalty of the Bourbon was no longer anything more than a dream. It appeared as if royalists, nobles, emigrants had never existed. It was not the consequence of a company. It was a great national movement like that of 1789 for liberty and on the ninth Thermidor against tyranny of the 18th Brumaire against incapacity. At what period did man witness defections so abrupt, so remarkable, and in some respects so sincere? What were the sentiments which at that time filled all hearts? Patriotism, love of glory, and an enlightened conviction that the newly accepted dynasty was enabled to do anything for the happiness and independence of the kingdom. And three months afterwards, this second dream also vanished.